Hello, everyone, and welcome to our combined Campbell Scientific and Meter webinar, Evapotranspiration, Pitfalls to Avoid, and Why It's Easier Than You Think. Today's presentation will be about 30 minutes, followed by about 10 minutes of Q&A with our presenters, Dirk Baker and Colin Campbell, whom I will introduce in just a moment. But before we start, we've got a couple of housekeeping items. First, we want this webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to answer any and or submit any and all questions in the questions pane, and we'll be keeping track of these for the Q&A toward the end. Second, if you want us to go back or repeat something uh, you've missed, don't worry, we will be sending around a recording to the webinar via email within the next three to five business days, along with a link to the slides. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's get started. Today, we'll hear from Drs. Dirk Baker and Colin Campbell, who will discuss fundamentals of evapotranspiration, what types of errors to watch out for, and what type of equipment is adequate for good ET estimates. Dirk Baker has been with Campbell Scientific since 2011 and is an application research scientist in the environmental group. His areas of interest include ecology, agriculture, and meteorology, among others. He has a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology and a doctorate in weed science, both from Colorado State University. Dirk's graduate and postdoctoral research centered around measuring and modeling wind-driven plant dispersal. Colin Campbell has been a research scientist at METER for 19 years, following his PhD at Texas A&M University in soil physics. He is currently serving as vice president of METER Environment. He is also adjunct faculty with the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Washington State University, where he co-teaches environmental biophysics, a class he took over from his father, Galen, nearly 20 years ago. Colin's early research focused on field scale measurements of CO2 and water vapor flux, but has shifted toward moisture and heat flow instrumentation for the soil plant atmosphere continuum. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Colin to get us started. Thanks, Brad. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today and especially a pleasure to join with my friend and colleague, Dirk Baker from Campbell Scientific in our first joint seminar together. As partner companies, it's great to be able to start giving some of the combined knowledge we have of the sciences to, to all of you. And today, it's my special pleasure to talk about something that, that I consider really important in our research, evapotranspiration. And the reason we title, titled it Why It's Easier Than You Think is that for me personally, I've often kind of shied away from using evapotranspiration because I've, I've worried that it may be too difficult or there's too many parameters that I need to know to be able to actually use this in my studies. Now, something that, that I learned as a young graduate student studying rice in South Texas was that every day, a well-watered crop like rice loses between seven and 10 millimeters of water. Uh, of course, this has to be a, a nice clear day, uh, but that's an amazing amount of water to be lost during, during a, just a, a single uh, day growing period. Now, knowing exactly how much water a canopy is losing is vital. And there are a lot of different reasons one may want to, to know this. These are a few that I thought up, but you probably can think of a bunch more. Things like how much water do we need to replenish uh, with irrigation after that it's lost during a day for a crop. We might want to explore different phenotypic water use based on different different uh, plants that we're growing. It also can be an, an indicator of drought. It can be a surrogate of biomass production and growth models depend on, on this kind of analysis to, to estimate how much growth we have day after day. Now, why is uh, evapotranspiration or ET so complicated? Well, I'm not sure that it is, but it certainly has that reputation. And one of the reasons is that because of the, the different ways you have to go about finding it. First, and probably the most complex, is measuring it directly. And I have a system here from Campbell Scientific, an eddy covariance system that can measure the up and down eddies moving above a system that we're interested in and using this system, we can figure out how much water vapor or CO2 or trace gases are moving uh, into and out of that ecosystem we're interested in. And we can be quite accurate with this system, but there are problems. 
the cost of the system is is often such that that many struggle to to uh, put in a system like this and the maintenance and effort involved trying to make sure you get good data and and that you get great data over time is also pretty intensive so many have focused on measuring et indirectly which is basically using the residual of an energy balance or energy budget analysis this comes with lower cost and we'll talk about some of the the benefits in a moment but it has associated assumptions that limit its accuracy and we're going to talk about that in my, my portion of the seminar so as i thought about trying to estimate water loss from a canopy the first thing that comes to my mind is the thought that, well, if we really wanted to just measure this, this value E, the evaporation, why not do it the simplest way possible? And there is an equation, and I teach this in that environmental biophysics class that was mentioned earlier, that just says to get evaporation, we need to know the ability of water vapor to move from the point, from the starting point to the ending point, basically inside the leaves in this canopy to the to the atmosphere and the difference in concentration inside the leaf and in the atmosphere. So this would make a very simple analysis if we just use this equation, but there is a major problem with this. It involves this conductance to vapor and that in turn, the conductance of vapor over here depends both on the conductance in va vapor in the air, which we get with a turbulent transport equation, but we can calculate that but also this conductance to vapor of the, the surface or that canopy. And we don't know the canopy conductance. In fact, we know that it actually changes quite a bit over time, depending on several factors that cause stomates to open and close. And so this simple approach that would allow us to get evaporation from a plant canopy um, and require us only need to know the ability of water vapor uh, to leave the canopy and go into the atmosphere and also require us to know the, the leaf temperature, this is actually very difficult because we don't know often the leaf temperature. There are better ways to do that now than there have been, but it's still a difficult way to analyze this. And we struggle uh, calculating that canopy conductance accurately. So we needed a better solution. So there's a connection that, that people, most people understand, which uh, ties together evaporation from a, a surface and what we call the continuity equation or an energy balance that just says that the net radiation coming into a system, Rn, um, minus all the sources or sinks of radiation in that system, sensible heat flux, H, uh, latent heat flux, lambda E, and soil heat flux, G, all of that should sum to zero. And because in that equation, we have that evaporation, if we rearrange it, we actually have this again, pretty simple equation that says the evaporation should be re related to the net radiation, sensible heat flux, soil heat flux divided by the latent heat of vaporization, lambda. So that would be easy, except for the fact that we have a lot of things going on with that radiation term that are fairly difficult to calculate. And in the end, we have to know something of the radiation coming into our system we're interested in, but also, and very importantly, the, the radiation that's given off or emitted by that system, if it's a canopy, for example. So again, the basic assumption in evapotranspiration is that energy and mass flow are connected. And if we know all other forms of energy movement, latent heat flux, is the residual and therefore we can solve for evap evaporation. Now, this is a little more complex than, than this uh, summary kind of gets us to. And this was understood back many years ago by a man named Howard Penman, who worked at the Rothamsted Research Station in the United Kingdom. And his understanding of the link between energy balance and evaporation led him to write this paper. I, I just threw up a picture of the, the first page of that paper. It's very famous from 1948 on natural evaporation from open water, bare soil, and grass. And um, he produced an equation based on this energy balance or energy budget that was able to analyze evaporation based on those other parts of the energy balance. 
But one of the problems with this paper was that it included an empiricism, an F value, uh, that tried to take into account the things that he couldn't solve for in the equation. And essentially, that made that equation work quite well for Rothamsted and a few other areas, but it wasn't universally applicable. One cool note about Dr. Penman was that to get to get measurements from his research, he used to spend the night at the the little experiment station they had there in the in the the shed in his sleeping bag, waking up every hour when his alarm clock rang to remember to take different measurements. I think that's a one of the best recommendations I have for for why it's so wonderful to have data loggers these days. So a critical step forward was made by a man named John Monteith many years later. He recognized the importance of having heat and vapor conductance in the equations that Dr. Penman put together. Nowadays, when I learned this equation, I didn't even realize that no one knew that fact since we had learned the conductances first and having them in the Penman-Monteith equation just made so much sense. I didn't realize that at some point people didn't recognize the importance of understanding the ability of water vapor uh, to move from inside the leaf to the outside of the leaf and outside a leaf into the into the, the atmosphere. And also the same way from, from heat to move from the canopy, sensible heat from, to move from the canopy to the air. So what he did was put together uh, these ideas of vapor conductance, so that in the in the canopy and the boundary layer, the air, and the conductance of heat to the boundary layer in a couple of terms inside this equation, where there's that GV, the, the con conductance of vapor uh, in the upper right hand uh, of the Penman-Monteith equation, and then this gamma star equation that not only recognized, so, so the original just gamma, uh, this is, was the, the heat capacity over the latent heat of vaporization. Now we're multiplying that by a ratio of the conductance to heat to the conductance of vapor. And this gave our psychrometer constant now a star, so gamma star. And that, that recognized the, the adjustments we have to make when those, those things are out of, out, of, out of a unity proportion. So John Monteith understood the importance of, of this heat and vapor conductance. And this new equation was really exciting because it removed the empiricism that, that Penman's original equation had in it and became a practical solution for a broad set of locations. Now, the arguments continue today. Does this equation fit everywhere? And as, as Dirk will start talking about in his presentation, well, we need some some uh, simplifications for this, but it actually is applicable across a very broad range of, of things. But there is a problem here in that that there are some things that we may not have uh, values for, and we're going to have to make estimates. Now, I put up a picture of John Monteith here, and I, I have to say, as I talk about him, I got to meet John when I was a seven-year-old boy, and my father was going for a sabbatical in England with Dr. Monteith at the University of Nottingham. And he is was described to me by many, as I've gotten older, as a classic Scottish gentleman. But I knew him as the nice white-haired man that sat me on his lap from Heathrow Airport to Nottingham and just talked with me and, and asked me questions the whole way. A wonderful man and who is truly missed in our science. Now let's talk about some of these practical aspects of Penman Monteith that I mentioned before and I said I'd get back to. So if we're going to do this indirect method, this energy balance method of getting a, a, our evapotranspiration, uh, we've got to recognize there are some good things and some bad things about this. Some of the positives are that, that we're going to spend a lot less money on the solution. For example, the Atmos 41 or Climb of U50 is much lower cost than in these other symptoms as systems. They're easier to maintain. And even like, for example, that Atmos 41 Climb of V50 is very fast to deploy. We can do it in just a few minutes. But there are some negatives about this. And I've drawn this into my diagram here on the, on, on the right-hand side. There are some assumptions that, that may lead to some inaccuracies. One thing is that, for example, the Climb of V50 Atmos 41 just measures solar radiation coming in. 
But as I've tried to draw here, while it is going to collect the solar diffuse radiation, things like the solar reflected and all these black arrows coming out here that, that I'm trying to draw in the, the, the long wave radiation, both downwelling and upwelling, it's not going to capture. So that we're gonna to have to make an assumption about that that I'll show you in just a moment. It also requires an ongoing canopy assessment of your particular canopy, because as I'll mention in a moment, we're not going to actually get the ET from our canopy. We're gonna get the supposed ET from a reference canopy and then, and then convert it over to our canopy using what we call a crop coefficient. And unfortunately, we can only make hourly or daily assessments, another thing that Dirk will talk about in a moment. So what do we need to, to gather for our Penman Monteith uh, that, that may, or to estimate that maybe just a little beyond uh, what we're gonna be able to measure with a typical weather station? Well, there is a net radiation there. We've got to convert over from a, a solar radiation, also soil heat flux, which we don't mention a lot in, in our presentation here. Over a day, we're just gonna assume that's gonna be zero, but we could maybe be more accurate if we had an actual measurement of that and canopy conductance. So let's talk about some of these measurements here. So if we had a complete suite of instruments, we wouldn't have too much of a problem estimating ET. Now, someone who's long been messing around with energy balance may be arguing with me here that we still have a consistent problem that, that closing completely the energy balance is something that we haven't quite done yet. So I'm not arguing that we would be able to do that completely with the instruments I'm showing, but especially with something like this four band uh, net radiometer. So we're collecting both upwelling and downwelling short wave radiation and long wave radiation in this device. Then we go, get a long ways toward at least getting an accurate measurement of our net radiation, a big piece of this analysis. We could also put things like a soil heat flux plate shown here. This is a red device uh, into the soil and then we can get estimates of soil heat flux across the day. We can even step a little for, uh, further and get a canopy temperature. This is not something that, that was very easily done, certainly back in the days of, of John Monteith, but even when I was a, a brand new graduate student, I remember kind of talking about some of these instrumentation and, and, and my professor rolling out a $10,000 instrument that we could measure the, the infrared temperature of individual leaves in a canopy. Now we can do that much more easily, but, but the science is advancing pretty quickly. So instead of that, our typical weather station will only have some of these parameters. And so here, here's the Atmos 41 or the Climb of U50. We have total solar radiation here. We have wind speed here. Up, up inside here, we've got a temperature me measurement that's accurately corrected for our solar radiation and wind speed. We've got humidity and sub several other measurements that we're able to do this analysis of ET. But in there, we're forced to make some assumptions. So as Dirk will mention, there are a couple ways to, to, to estimate ET. One is FAO 56, and I chose this particular one just to talk about how we've simplified some of the things within the penman monteith equation. So here, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna estimate our own ET from a reference ET of an idealized canopy. Now, there are two types of canopies. I'm only gonna focus on grass, but but Dirk will mention alfalfa as well. So grass is that we're going to idealize here. It's 12 centimeters high, it's well watered. And if we do that, we can then use some, some of these simplifications I've shown here on the right-hand side. Instead of using our turbulent transport equation, if we mount our, our weather station at two meters, then the, the, these two conductances, the boundary layer conductances to heat and to vapor, just turn into a multiplier, or a constant of 0.2 multiplied by the wind speed. <coughs> the conductance to vapor is also simplified. Here we're going to assume that the canopy conductance is about 0.6 moles per meter squared per second. Now that's higher than an individual leaf conductance. I've measured those many, many times. They're typically for a well-watered leaf are around 0.2, or 0.2 moles per meter squared per second. 
Uh, but there's a rule of thumb. We can multiply by three and get a canopy conductance. Now you see some of these empiricisms coming in. And then we just have the, the conductance to vapor that includes the canopy conductance and the, the boundary layer conductance. We combine them together in this equation to get an overall GV just as a function of, again, the wind speed. Same thing for the psychrometer constant, gamma star. Uh, we have a multiplier here that just includes the wind speed. So the other piece that we have to estimate is the net radiation. And errors to the net radiation are, are going to be in Dirk's talk. But I'll mention here that if we only have solar radiation, we have a constant that we're going to multiply our solar radiation by. And then we're going to subtract from it things related to the average temperature, the vapor pressure, and in a function of cloudiness. So this side of the equation actually takes into account our long wave radiation portion and is a base, based on lots of experiments to tie the, the net radiation to the, the total income, incoming solar radiation, but it is a simplification. So why does this work? Well, we multiply this by our crop coefficient to adjust it to our specific need. And then using this specific surface, this idealized surface, this 12 centimeter grass, we can, in, and other things like the canopy conductance and the, the net radiation, we can make this estimate of ET. And now I'm gonna turn the time over to, to Dirk, who's gonna continue our discussion. Thank you, Colin, and thanks everybody for joining us. And it's a, a, pl a real pleasure to be able to collaborate with Meter and Colin, and I look forward to, to future collaborations as well. So this is a, another version um, or another what uh, another way to write the Penn and Montes equation. And I won't go into, into a lot of detail because co Colin's covered a lot of this already. But there's a couple of things that, if you're like me, they'd stick out very quickly. First, we have this strange constant of 0 0.408. Um, now, if you remember from Colin's uh, talk, there's usually you'd see, uh, or you would see the, the lambda in the denominator. So one over lambda or the latent heat of vaporization is simply that 0 0.408. And then the other two uh, that are so clearly uh, described there in the list of parameters are the CN and CD, or the numerator constant and the denominator constant. So uh, the the strange description there aside, these are really just relating to a lot of the canopy uh, that simplifications that Collins talked about. And so these are uh, dependent. These are basically a lookup table of uh, of the values that would be used for either if you're using a short or tall reference, and then if it's an hourly calculation, then whether it's day or night time. Okay, so. As Colin alluded to, there are a couple of uh, formulation of Penn Montes that are at least the most commonly used in the world. One is that FAO 56, that's the Food and Agriculture Organization, it's part of the UN. And the other is the ASCE standardized reference, and this is the American Society of Civil Engineers. And there's links there at the bottom to both of these. Uh, you can get the full versions for at no cost. Um, so the difference between these are, is really not there. Uh, in fact, if you wanted to look, I think it's in the appendices of the ESC standardized reference, there are some comparisons of, of these two and as well as a couple other methods of, of calculating ET um, using Penn and Monteith. Uh, the meter uses uh, or provides a, a daily calculation based on FAO 56 in the Zentra cloud and Campbell Scientific has the ASCE hourly calculation. Um, now, the difference between daily and hourly uh, is really pretty small most of the time. The only time you'd see significant variation or significant differences is, is if you have substantial variation in less than a day in one or more of the measurements. Um, and I have heard of some, some efforts to do even shorter time intervals, but again, I think that relates to uh, whether or not, and it could be done, uh, I just don't know that you'd gain a lot because uh, you'd have to have significant variation in, in one or more of the measurements at that time scale for that to make much of a difference. And coming back to this equation now, um, now I've added the list of measurements that we would use either with FAO 56 or ASCE um, against the list of parameters. And the first thing that sticks out is that there's only two of these parameters that are directly measured, and that's temperature and wind speed. 
And so, so the rest of these are modeled to one degree or another. And so things like the saturation vapor pressure and the vapor pressure, these are pretty straightforward relationships just based on temperature and relative humidity. But uh, the, especially net radiation is heavily modeled to get to that. So then the question becomes, um, what, which of these measurements are the most important? Which ones do we want to be most concerned about the, the, uh, the accuracy? And so here's a, an attempt to render what amounts to be uh, about six different dimensions, if you will, into two dimensions. So bear with me for a moment while I explain this. So this figure holds um, the, four, the, the three measurements constant uh, while varying one other. And then there's the other two dimensions that are held constant for all of these. And those are just the, the time and the, the, the location of the, the measurement. And location just matters for solar, solar angle. And so what's held constant for all of these figures here is the location, which is mid-latitude, and the time, which is uh, a mid midday on a summer day. Um, and so the short of this is that the steeper the slope, the more sensitive the calculation of ET is to that measurement. Um, and I won't go into it. You can, this will be provided as a recording, so if you want to spend more time with it, uh, it does. It took me a little, a little bit to get my head around all of the interactions here. But so you can glance at this quickly at least and see that the steepest slope there is that that incoming radiation, uh, as measured by a pyranometer. And so that is the most important measurement. Now because these do interact, uh, there's some other generations that we can that we can make. So one is this idea that. Um, that if if wind decreases or relative humidity increases, then the radiation is, is that much more important. And the other is if radiation decreases, then wind speed has the larger influence on that calculation of ET. Now going into a little bit more detail on radiation, uh, these, this on the left is the same figure I just showed. Uh, so this is the sensitivity of the calculation in evapotranspiration to incoming radiation versus the net radiation, which again has all of that modeling to get to net radiation from uh, incoming radiation and temperature. And so you can see that that's an even steeper slope. So it's even more sensitive to net radiation. Okay, so one of my interests is in understanding better how uncertainty and especially measurement uncertainty what implications there are for that uncertainty for various decisions or, or inference that we might make in either decision-making or in, in research. So this is, a, is one way that I, that's part of a, a white paper that I'm working on. It's one way to try to get at the combined uncertainty from all of the sensors that are being used to, to come up with an ET calculation. So this is from data from a seven-day period is totalized ET over that seven-day seven day period at a site in southern Utah. Uh, so the blue columns are from the measurements, so they're just calculated directly from the measurements from the weather station for that period. And then the error bars, the red error bars, are a combined uncertainty uh, that differ in a sort of a hypothetical set of sensors. And so these represent a high, medium, and low measurement uncertainty. And then it also shows the data for both a short and a tall reference. And so the short we haven't talked about this much, but the short is, again, what Colin mentioned is a short grass, often thought of like a turf grass, and the tall is, is a, an alfalfa. And so either one of those are used as references for various applications. And so the short of the interpretation here is that while these errors would accumulate over time, um, the contribution of the sensor them itself to uh, uncertainty in the, the calculation of ET is, is relatively small. Okay, so there are some simplifications and improvements that, um, and there's a lot of research in, the, in this area. Um, one that I'll mention is there are alternatives to Penman Monteith that use fewer measurements. Now, the short of this is that we would generally not recommend it because we're, we're doing even more modeling uh, to come up with an, a, a calculation of ET. And so if you can avoid that, um, I would go with uh, as many measurements as you can do 
as, as you can afford. And as Colin mentioned, the, the simplest improvement here is to directly measure the net radiation that gets rid of all of that modeling and assumptions about uh, what's going on in the, with net radiation. Um, so, but that can be a, an added expense. And so adding in the four, four component net radiometer would also mean that with either the easily done uh, calculation from either meter or Campbell Scientific, then there would be some additional work to do that calculation since both of those equations, the ASCE and the FAO 56, are assuming a incoming radiation, not net radiation as the input. And then of course, if uh, the more direct measurement is a full ID covariance suite, or uh, even more so would be uh, a lysimeter, which we haven't talked about, but that's um, that much more intensive and expensive and interesting to maintain. So the place where we have the greatest opportunity uh, as users um, of an FAO 56 or, or uh, ASCE calculation is in the siting of the weather station, the installation, and its maintenance. And so one thing to consider is the, the height and especially the wind speed. And so the, uh, the, these equations of Penman Monteith assume that that measurement height is at two meters. So, and that conflicts with a lot of weather station needs, which put that wind speed measurement up at, up at 10 meters. So these equations do do an adjustment. Uh, so you can input the height of the measurement height of the, sorry, of the wind speed sensor, and then it will do an adjustment based on a log widden profile to that to make it as if it were at two meters. So there's an additional level of modeling with some potential for error there. Temperature, um, radiation shielding is always important, um, and even passive shields can introduce some error if you have a lot of uh, incoming solar radiation and not much wind. But given the lower sensitivity of the calculation of ET to temperature, the addition of something like an aspirated shield probably isn't necessarily worth the, the, the investment uh, at the maintenance and cost. Uh, unless you need a, a high accuracy temperature measurement for another purpose. And so coming ag again to the solar, this is where the, the biggest opportunity to make sure you're getting good measurements is. And so making sure that solar sensor is mounted well, it's clean and stays clean and is level. So even some dust, let alone uh, bird deposits, are, are going to cause some substantial error in that solar input, uh, leading to an underestimate of ET. And so in level would cause a bias, a time bias. And so depending on which direction uh, that solar sensor is, that higher number is, is pointing, it could be, you know, if it's pointed east or west, then you're, the, given the time of day, it would be uh, higher or lower than it should be. And especially for solar, uh, we, we recommend calibrating it every couple of years. Now talking a little bit about the influence or how large of a geophic, geographic area a set of sensors is um, is relating to versus how high it is. So the higher uh, a sensor is mounted, the the greater the geographic extent uh, is its is area of influence. Um, and that's why, in a lot of cases, weather stations are mounted higher. So it's not just the local conditions that it's it, that it's uh, relevant to. However, that does mean that if those, up, especially upwind conditions, differ strongly from those of interest, then you'd introduce that much more uncertainty and bias potentially into the ET calculation. So mounting it lower, uh, which is why the two meter height is a general rule of thumb, depending on canopy height. Now, if you're measuring a forest, that's gonna be really challenging because that's a very tall canopy and getting measurements above that canopy is obviously a, a real challenge logistically. Um, however, or, or if you're measuring a tall crop, then the measurement height above that, uh, say it's corn, then just need to make sure that your measurements are above that corn, the highest corn ca uh, canopy. Okay, just a few summary points. We've kind of harped on this, but that net radiation is the most important parameter. So though it is largely modeled, uh, so the simplest improvement is to directly measure that net radiation. But the key part is to make sure your siting, installation, and maintenance are, are kept up, and these are more important than sensor uncertainty 
uh, given a certain, you know, the, this, the data that I showed did assume a certain level of, of sensor quality uh, and accuracy. These are what the, the kinds of sensors you'd get from either meter or, or candle scientific, um, not real low end sensors. Um, and then crop coefficients, we've, which we've also not really addressed here. That's a, it's a big topic. And that's how you go from this, this reference ET to your crop of interest or your system of interest. Uh, it can be very challenging and error prone to, to estimate these crop coefficients. Some are, are more widely available and better estimated than others. But it might be better, get, uh, depending on your, your system and how you're using ET, which is uh, definitely something we're interested in hearing from you, is how you're using it. It might be better in a lot of cases just to use the reference ET as an index, not necessarily a direct number. Um, but that would be an interesting thing to hear more from you about what you're interested in is uh, in ET and how you're using or how you'd like to use it. And with that, um, I'll close and thank you very much for your time and we look forward to any questions you have. All right. Thanks a bunch, Dirk. Thank you, Colin. Um, we do have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, before we start the Q&A section, um, we are going to post a quick poll um, just to see uh, your thoughts, yes or no, on, on, on how this webinar had helped or possibly change your perspective on ET. So I'm gonna start that poll. Uh, I'll leave it up for a few seconds just to get enough people to, um, uh, to answer, get a good, a good sample size there. Um, and while you're answering that poll, um, I did wanna let you know that um, you can still enter your questions in the questions pane. And like I said, we'll take a few minutes. We'll see how far we get. Um, we do have a bunch of questions that have come in already. And I just want, just want to warn everybody, we will not be able to get to everybody's question, but we do have them recorded. Um, and so if we do not, uh, so feel free to, to submit your question. If we do not get to it, um, either Colin or Dirk or somebody else from our uh, meter environment or Campbell Scientific teams will be able to get back to you uh, individually via the email that you registered with to answer your question. So please, yeah. Uh, feel free to to ask any and all questions that you have. All right. Okay. Thank you for everybody who responded to that poll. Um, I think uh, your your participation has been valuable. Thank you. All right. So questions here. Um, this first question is asking. Um, and again, this is open to Colin or Dirk or both of you. Um, what percent of the water given based on daily ET is really used for the plant? I'm assuming this depends on the plant in many ways, right? Yeah, so so I can take a shot at that and, and make and, and Dirk, you can too. So there, so this really depends on on a lot of things. One is is the the soil wetness the surface wetness of the soil as well as the canopy closure and so it's it's difficult to actually say how much that would be but let's say we have a completely closed canopy something like i was showing in that first picture of, of a beautiful potato canopy if it's fully closed closed then um the percentage of water given i mean some is going to evaporate off leaves if, if you've got it like a center pivot irrigation laying the water down um, but in general, uh, if, if we just talk about the water that actually makes it into the soil or that are accessed by the roots, it can be up toward 90% of the water uh, given is actually used in, in evapotranspiration. At least that, that's what I understand. Dirk, do you have a different number? Uh, I don't have a number. The, the first thing I think of as kind of from the ecology standpoint or, standpoint or the natural system standpoint is there's going to be a tremendous amount of variation. Um, based on what types of plants or community of plants um, are of interest. Um, you know, desert ecosystems especially are very well adapted to close stomates or have a waxy surface to, to minimize water loss. And so it's really, and that's why we do reference, to, reference ET for, for a variety of other reasons as well. But that's, that's what the first thing that I thought about. All right. Uh, another question here, can we implement FAO 56 equations using conductances derived from eddy covariance? I'm going to let Dirk answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, well, I since I think that would take some work. Uh, I guess I'm I'm not. Uh, it would take some time digging into the equations to see how that how that would work. I, I think that just off the cuff, it would it might not it might be more something that you'd put into uh, something analogous to a crop coefficient. Colin, do you have? Yeah, it? that's interesting. Interesting thought. I think. I mean, first of all, why are you doing this if you've got eddy eddy covariance? You could do it directly. <laughs> right. But maybe maybe the question is, hey, if we put an edit covariance system out in the field uh, and and used it for a while to try to get at a at a a, a uh, canopy conductance, could we then use a weather station after that to and, and insert maybe a better estimate of the the canopy conductance in that point six? Um, and so, from my point of view, sure, uh, improve upon that. That that's a, a solid number, as you saw, you saw in the equation. Yeah constant so what are your thoughts on that does that change your your view there Dirk no no I think that's that's kind of where I was going is that the um that if or my assumption was what was kind of what you're saying is that they were had to, had the opportunity to maybe get the the estimates from another location or or short-term deployment of an ET st station so that's how they were able to get some of these better estimates so, so yeah definitely opportunities for oppor for improvement um, it would just take the work at digging into those equations and seeing where you can make those improvements. I kind of, well, I won't go into digressions. <laughs> I'll stop there. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, where do you recommend installing the weather station to use this type of ET method in an agricultural crop? I, I can jump in there and Dirk, I'll step first in line because that was what I was messing around with last summer quite a bit. and and. Dirk mentioned this of locating your weather station in an area with appropriate fetch. Um, that that means the the area with which the, is kind of with the prevailing wind or the wind that's blowing that's actually moving the the eddies uh, of the the surface that you're interested in. So we compared a weather station that was just regional. It was about uh, six or seven kilometers away from our field we call, I don't know, a regional weather station, that's almost semi-local, to one that we actually installed out in the field where we were, we had uh, our our canopy, our, our, our plants of interest, and it's interesting how different those values were, and and so, um, you know, getting it in the location that, that you're interested in learning about is really critical, but I want to see what Dirk says, because he really covered this in his presentation. Yeah, I, that's the same kind of thing I was thinking of, and and there, you know, just be aware that no matter, you know, depending on say, you know, the worst case kind of scenario is a small irrigated crop in the middle of a desert. Um, no matter where you mount your or install your station, you're going to have some influence of that surrounding station, surrounding area. But you know, being aware of that fetch, where the prevailing winds are coming from. Um, and making sure you mount your your sensors as you know at that two meters or as at least um, close to wherever the maximum canopy height is going to be, um, and either on the downwind side um, or kind of in the center of a of a field, I guess uh, would be the the general recommendations I would have. Okay, okay. a couple more questions here. Uh, this next one. Um, so adding the four component net radiometer can improve accuracy of the reference ET, but then it breaks intercomparability of those calculated values with the standard Henry Monteith calculations. Uh, would this invalidate the use of published crop coefficients? Oh man, I'm gonna throw that <laughs> to Dirk again. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I know this is done. Um, so people have done this, and it's not necessarily my area of expertise. There's some some good work, um, some papers which, uh, sorry, I'm not remembering off the top of my head the the titles or or um, published dates, but I know our colleague over at, at Apogee, uh, Mark Blomquist, has spent quite a bit of time with evapotranspiration, and he's done some work with colleagues on evaluating some of these. Uh, 
uh, using a direct measurement of, of net radiation um, as opposed to the, the model version that's in the standard implementation of FAO 56 or ASCE. So I I, you know, that's something where I was, I started to go on di a digression. I'll try to, to minimize my time here, but um, I kind of get a little bit circular in these because all of these estimates are, there's a lot of um, kind of empiricism in, in these equations. And so once you start tweaking with some of the measurements, does that then start breaking down the rest of the calculations? And I think that's a valid question. It's not something I spent a lot of time in the literature. So there might be people even in the audience that have a better answer than I do. Um, so that's kind of a non-answer, but um, Colin, I don't know if you, if you know if you have other thoughts there. Yeah, I think that was just an excellent answer, and just kind of what I was thinking as well. That, that it's great if you have that for a component. You, as we've talked about, you make big strides in getting closer to the right uh, answer from a from the perspective of of a, a penman monteith equation. Remember that original equation I talked about was, you know there we could directly estimate the evapotranspiration from a specific crop. So once you get a four component uh, net radiometer out there, if you can go a little bit further and, and close off some of these other questions like a canopy temperature measurement to try to estimate uh, canopy conductance, you may be not in line for a reference ET, but in line to actually get your actual ET from the field. So, or you can go, you know, so, so you can either go with crop coefficients and maybe adjust them, maybe, making like an eddy covariance measurement out in the field just for some validations initially to, to learn whether you're doing it right, or you can go straight to an ET calculation once you've got a few of these other pieces. Okay. I think we've got time for one more question and I'm going to cheat and squish a bunch together. Uh, there are people asking about their various applications, uh, specific applications that um, are uh, a bit um, off of the normal from what we've discussed here today. Um, so. What are some suggestions you might have for those uh, trying to measure ET in, say, for instance, um, open water or greenhouses or vineyards or um, along those lines? Well, um, so I'm going to integrate uh, Dirk in here maybe with thoughts. But, but as I came in here, several of you sent in great questions beforehand talking about, hey, what do we do with potted plants, for example? Mm -hmm. What do we do with forest canopies? You know what do we do about different things and and one of the amazing things about ET uh, is that it's one of the most intensely studied topics in literature. So there's a lot of great literature on each one of these and and I I by no means am, am an expert on ET, but I do know kind of where to point some people in some articles and it may be something that that you'll have to look into to more. There's a great open water article. Uh, I think it was by uh, one of my uh, friends Jay Ham put something together on that. Maybe we can link that when we send this out if I can find it. For greenhouses, um, a good friend of, of mine, uh, Marcel Fuchs, a colleague of my father's who was a visiting professor when I was really young, uh, did some work on greenhouses and maybe we could point you to some of that work. Uh, I'm not super familiar with vineyards, but I'm going to turn it over to Dirk to give some thoughts on, on some of these too. Yeah, so my first thought for, uh, which would be, I would hesitate, hesitate to actually recommend this, but when it's over, wa over water, then the transpiration component of ev evapotranspiration kind of goes away unless you have a lot of, say, floating plants and that kind of thing. That's my first thought. And so what you're really looking at is evaporation. Um, and so there is something called an evaporation pan that's a measurement directly of ev evaporation. There's even ways of turning that into, um, which I'm not that familiar with, but there are ways of using an evaporation pan to get at uh, evapotranspiration. Um, they're high maintenance. Uh, they're kind of challenging to work with. So that's why I'm, I hesitate a little bit to recommend it. But if, if it's open water, then my first thought is that you're you're more interested in in evaporation than the transpiration component, but I may be missing something in that equation or in that question. Um, I have not spent time looking at this. It seems like it would be really complicated to try to do this in in a in a in a closed system like a a greenhouse. But that's just my first thought. I would be interested in those references too, Colin. Um, so. That's kind of my first thought. There was, uh, well, am I missing other parts of that question? A vineyard, 
was discussed. And I think, I mean, my experience is that that that's been well worked on. Uh, do you know any references for that? I don't, but uh, yeah, I would think that I, I'm sure that there's work there. Um, I think that the key part of that is that what you'd use as a reference and how much, you know, whether they're using um, how much you'd have bare soil coming into it versus a closed canopy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems There's like a, that would be the, the key part of that. And, and, you know, maybe if I can add, Brad, just as, as a last comment, because it reminded me of one of the questions that came in from our uh, pre-webinar email. Um, the, the question really related how to tie evaporation to in-soil measurements. And, and I think we have another virtual seminar that we, we may be able to link for that question, but but one of the things that we see as a critical uh, step forward in the future is tying evapotranspiration, the stuff we talked about today, with in-soil measurements. Uh, so mm -hmm. with water potential, we can we can see how the plants are doing in the soil. We can see what's lost through through ET, how the plants are doing with the soil in the soil, and things like some remote sensing tied in. We're using satellite data to locate where we should put sensors and to evaluate stress. Uh, on, on a field scale, these things are getting tied together. So I don't want people to come away from the seminar thinking, okay, ET is the only tool that I have in my toolbox to be able to assess uh, plant health. Yeah, the, some some really cool work in drone, um, at, you know, using drones as, as supplemental to this or even the primary measurement, um, not to undermine us, but the the same kind of thing as satellite or, or aerial image, imagery can really be informative there. And that's not something I have necessarily expertise, but it's interesting stuff. All right. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Colin. That's going to wrap it up for us today. Uh, we've gone over. Thank you for everybody who has stayed on and listening to this. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed this discussion as much as we have. And again, thank you for um, all of your great questions. We, we have, uh, Dozens and dozens, over 100 questions here uh, have been submitted, and so we definitely did not get to all of them. Uh, but again, uh, somebody from our team, whether uh, Colin or Dirk or somebody else from our teams, will be able to get back to you to answer your questions. Um, also, please consider answering the short survey that will appear after this webinar is finished, just to tell us what types of webinars you'd like to see in the future. Um, and for more information on what you've seen today, please visit metergroup.com and campbellsci.com. And finally, look for the recording of today's presentation in your email and stay tuned for future Meter webinars. Thanks again, stay safe, and have a great day.